give the word? Throw the first switch. You've got it, master. Get ready. Again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IMMP podcast. My name is Matthew Porter, and I'm Ian Porter. I'm his dad. He's my son, and we are still celebrating the Halloween season. <laughs> Last time you heard that from Ian, we were talking about the 1931 Universal Pictures Frankenstein. Exactly, a classic. But also not anything like the actual original book, Frankenstein. Yeah, we talked quite a bit about that in our previous episode. You've, you've, you've got to step back and think about what that movie is trying to do as much, at least, as you need, need to compare it to the novel that it's adapting. Exactly. So it's kind of awesome that this time we get to, to go for com- something completely different which is an adaptation that sticks remarkably true to the thing it's adapting. <laughs> yes. Which sticks almost exactly like some of the things it's basing itself off of. We are talking about the 1974 Mel Brooks movie, Young Frankenstein. Yep. I, I, I honestly should have seen this one coming. I was, because I know that you're setting up a theme for the spooky month. I know you're going to do it. And I thought, okay, Frankenstein, are we doing like other universal monsters? What are we doing here? And when I learned what our second was, it was like, oh, it's the one-two punch. I should have known. It was tempting just to do some of those universal Frankenstein sequels, but we would need a bigger month. It's hard to know where to stop there because they made four sequels to that 1931 Frankenstein, starting with The Bride of Frankenstein in 1935. Yeah, they've been... Which, actually, Patreon people, hey. (laughs) Yes, we will be talking about The Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. But not knowing really how to work in all of those Frankenstein sequels. And believe it or not, I really didn't see those Frankenstein sequels during the time period that our main episodes here cover, running till around the time I graduated from college. So instead, I decided on Young Frankenstein. And this is one of those three-generational movies. Yeah. Because I'm not just introducing it to you. This was a real favorite of my dad's. It was. My father was a big Mel Brooks fan that just hit his sense of humor, most of Mel Brooks' sense of humor. And Young Frankenstein was one of his favorites by far. I can completely understand I didn't I didn't know pop up but I from the bits I know I can absolutely understand <laughs> why this hit his sense of humor like that. There's times when Mel Brooks can be a bit more on the awkward comedy side for me. It 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 it's a mild version of my aversion to sitcom. But yeah. he's got a lot of clever and it's a mile a minute. So even the ones that don't land I skip over them like a stone and the next one hits. Yeah, there are some movies in which he leans into the cringe more than others. Yeah. But but I don't know that Young Frankenstein is one of them, partly because there was so much else for it to work with. And it's interesting to put Young Frankenstein into the context of what Mel Brooks did, because throughout the 70s, he was primarily making what I think of as just his genre parody series, where he made Blazing Saddles to parody Westerns. He made High Anxiety to parody Hitchcock thrillers. He made Young Frankenstein to parody classic monster movies. He even made a movie called Silent Movie, which was a silent movie about somebody in modern-day Hollywood trying to get backing to make a silent movie. Oh, goodness. I have not seen that one. Okay. And so I, and I tend to like hit those genre parodies most of what Mel Brooks did. But uh, but I, for me too, Young Frankenstein is my favorite. It's probably one of the best. 
I would agree of the Mel Brooks styled things because they are do we're, I'm, I'm just going to start kind of it, honestly enough. It doesn't start where the original movie starts. No, 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 it does set up before that. But when they get into the original movie territory, they do shot for shot line for line moments. But by just emphasizing the, it a little differently, it goes from dramatic and horrible to silly and fun. And as with most good parodies, this is made at least as much as an homage. This was made by somebody who knew the original movies very well. And I don't think you get to know movies that well and make this kind of a parody of them without really loving them, without really appreciating them. And finding them worth this kind of fun commentary. A couple episodes ago, we did Homestar Runner, and I was gushing about how they they would do parodies of something with so much love and attention to getting it. And they were trying to strive for the kind of parody Mel Brooks is doing, to be very honest. As much yes. as I love them, Mel Brooks perfected what they were attempting. <laughs> and just as the 1931 Frankenstein in many respects, updated the story, had it taking place in the early 20th century and not in the time period when the novel was set. Young Frankenstein is set in the modern day, or at least the modern day of, of 1974. And by the way, there is, I think, a little bit more time between the production of Young Frankenstein and today than there was between the original Frankenstein and Young Frankenstein. Don't do this to me. <laughs> One moment. <laughs> Insert math noises, because I'm going to calculate this now. Let's look. Original, uh, the original Frankenstein came out. 1931. Yep, that's 1931. Oh, my 43 goodness. 43 years, and it's more than 43 years. Yeah, oh, my goodness. 2017 would have been it. <laughs> Ah, oh, we over we've overshot by five. Oh no, <laughs> we've overshot by five. So, Young Frankenstein is set more or less in 1974. We we initially see Gene Wilder's character, Frederick Frankenstein. <laughs> yes, Frederick Frankenstein is teaching in a modern medical school in the United States, and in our terminology, let that like we discuss at the end of every one of our episodes, this really is a revival. It is. It is a sequel in that, in at least some sense, it takes place in the same continuity as the originals, just with a very different skew on it. Uh, honestly, uh, I'm going to skip forward narratively a little. The Village talks about the every time this has happened, we've dealt with it. Yeah, it's actually a joke. <laughs> so it's like this is a world in which Frankenstein is, in fact, followed up by Bride of Frankenstein, Fr Son of Frankenstein, the Ghost of Frankenstein, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, uh, House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, and possibly Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. <laughs> These all could be canon, according to the way this one presents the town and the village and the lore of Frankenstein. Which is why uh, later on in the movie, when someone, uh, one of the village leaders is trying to explain the, the concerns that the people have, it's, well, you can understand their concerns given their experience on five separate previous occasions. Exactly. <laughs> Referencing the 1931 Frankenstein and its four sequels. Side note, do you think they actually are counting the Abbott and Costello as canon? I don't think so. Oh. Was that made by Universal? I guess that was made yeah, by Universal. Yeah, that was made by Universal. It's counted as a Universal-made Frankenstein movie. Yeah, I don't think they're counting that. Okay. I hope not. <laughs> I, I liked it when I was a kid. I don't think I'd put it in the same canon as the, the other Universal Frankenstein movies. Understood. It's in its own canon of, of Abbott and Costello movies, and we'll probably get there someday. Oh, goodness. But this begins... In 1974, with this doctor and t um, teacher, Frederick Frankenstein. He's changed the pronunciation. Because he is desperate to distance himself from this crazy kook, as he puts it, in his family tree. 
but he still does have this drive for science and medicine. He's still got that innate family business kind of energy about being energetic about doing his work and in some ways not caring in other in in other ways he's got a patient here that he shows a demonstration on and he just absolutely devastates this man yes with such a cold calmness that kind of immediately puts he might be on his rocker and not off his rocker right now but it ain't a stable one yes he's still got that soulless science kind of approach to what he does yeah and yeah that that's like you you get into some of that mel brooks physical comedy right away with this demonstration of reflex responses just essentially by beating up this volunteer patient and we also get slightly clumsy but kind of self-aware clumsy exposition where a student is asking him aren't you the grandson of the famous dr victor frankenstein who went into graveyards dug up freshly buried corpses and transformed dead components into... Yes! 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 We all know what he did. (laughs) But I'd rather be remembered for my own small contributions to science and not because of my accidental relationship to a famous... (laughs) cuckoo. So they establish... The relationship, they establish the connection, they establish that everything we know about Frankenstein from the other movies has already happened, and we get Frederick's relationship to all of this, which is to reject it. And they actually do a really good job in kind of giving that presentation, where the student is kind of standing up and lit and and talking and scripted like a character out of a bit more of the movies at that time. He sounds like he's one of... Dexter Riley's classmates standing up and ribbing a professor. And yet when you cut back to Mel Brooks's Frederick, he is this dramatic arms flailing cry to the heavens, classic black and white film kind of acting as a response. The overblown response is because he's almost talking in a different cinematic style. For a moment. That's a good point. We see this style versus style. There's this sense in which his protests notwithstanding, Frederick Frankenstein isn't really in his element in a late 20th century teaching hospital. Yeah. He gets into his element pretty early in the movie Mm -hmm. because he is brought word that he has inherited the Frankenstein estate in... In Transylvania, they've relocated it to Transylvania for the purposes of this movie. Yeah. I think because Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder had some Transylvania jokes and didn't think they were going to get to make a Dracula parody as well, so they shoved them into this. So soon he is in old Europe, which seems like it's a hundred years in the past. It does. And... From the time he arrives, even though he's trying to figure out the people and everything, he seems more in his element than he ever did in those opening scenes in the U.S. He does, and he gets kind of in the the groove of it, and he's just kind of, like, he settles in, and his his innate dramatic kind of nature fits the rest of the world. I do like their setting of the village and the castle and the town in general, because they make it lived in, but not, some people say lived in when they're describing something and it looks worn and it doesn't look pristine. It's lived in. Oh, that's great. I mean, it's lived in. If you're going to have to walk this place every day, you're going to do something to make it walkable. This is the same kind of castle aesthetic we got in the black and white films. But there's like these little bits about how you go about a place, how you'd live in a place that make it seem usable. Yeah, the the whole village seems more like a real place as opposed to a bunch of disconnected sets. Exactly. It's it's got life to it. And that means that when the entire kind of village as a place responds to him 
the environment they've created is enough of a location and a character all on its own that it can kind of have this sigh, here we go again, in the the world as a character in that sense. <laughs> so he inherits the castle and everything in it from, and now he is the new Baron because he's the heir to his his grandfather. I think it's single, once great or twice great grandfather, uh, Baron Frankenstein. And he's reluctantly moving in. He's interested and he's exploring. He does want to know about what kind of work they did. Mm -hmm. And yet he's still insisting that he, he is not his great grandfather. He is not one of those Frankensteins. And yet two things happen. The place seems to have an effect on him. We see him, he's having dreams in which this weight of being a Frankenstein is coming down upon him. And he's also met some interesting characters upon moving in. Yeah, we see that he already has kind of like uh, our character from the original movie. He's engaged to his, his, uh, his lovely Elizabeth, who is this fussy socialite who doesn't kind of want to be with him in some ways. <laughs> Madeline Kahn in a really fun role. Oh, yeah. Uh, but you're right. She, she insists that, that they, they're madly in love, but she's more interested in the party she's going to go to and making sure her dress looks right for it and that her nails are not scuffed. And she, we see her at the beginning, but then she comes back later. She's important to the plot later. He meets his assistant, who just in the same way he is uh, Frankenstein, his assistant is Igor. <laughs> and it's never clear to me, although every time I watch this movie, I have a different opinion. Based on this most recent watch, he said Igor totally to mess with Frederick. Mm -hmm. Because he, Frederick, again, corrects him. You know, it's, it's, it's Frankenstein. Oh, it's not Frankenstein? So you just, do you say Froderick Frankenstein? No, no, it's Frederick. Well, what's your name? Igor. Oh, I, I think he's, he's uh, putting one over on, uh, on the... Uh, on the doctor. And I think that Igor may be the smartest person in the whole movie. He is absolutely the smartest man in the room. He is self-aware. He is amusing himself with his own jokes. He's not putting any, any more effort than he has to, because why would he? Marty Feldman is playing a character who is doing his entire own movie. Yes. During this, he has his little jobs. He has his tasks. But honestly, if you told me that there was a middle section where he left and got a cup of coffee and we followed him, I'd be like, absolutely, he could steal the show like that and do it. <laughs> if Merlin from Excalibur simply didn't really have any interest in teaching anybody anything, he'd be a character like Igor. Yes. In it, off in his own movie, entertaining himself. Are you kidding me? I think I I think Excalibur's <laughs> Merlin and this ver and Igor here are probably poker buddies with the way they both interacted with their protagonist. And he also meets on arriving at the castle Inga, yeah. played by Terry Gar, and she's playing the Bavarian Bond bombshell, who is his lab assistant. And she she is not. She's not unaware she's just not quick at putting a a to b sometimes yes like she's smart enough to keep up she's just not fast enough to keep up sometimes and that's great when pair of characters who can get in their own heads miss something and she's the one just like wait a minute yeah or she's following more threads at once so she's not getting to any one location any one end point as quickly as others but she's aware of what's happening and and she kind of is the only one because she's following everything more than people think she's the only one that sees two things colliding <laughs> sometimes which is brilliant it's a way to play the the air quotes ditzy character without actually limiting or diminishing them she does a good job of being part of the team she's just not the same kind of part as everyone else. Uh, am I reading too much into this if I say that her character and the portrayal of her character is one more take on the Frankenstein theme of judging based upon appearances and first impressions? Absolutely. 
I don't because everybody responds to her immediately for her looks and affectation and questions her ability to be a lab assistant. And yet she proves to be a fine lab assistant yes. on multiple occasions. But no one no one waits to get that fact about her. They always judge her on the assumption first. And they always they always assume Igor is going to be this stalwart following the commands. But no, he's doff doing his own thing and <laughs> absolutely thinks his boss is a, is a menace and a, a fool half the time. Yeah, and it's great. He's making jokes and doing Groucho Marx impressions exactly. and just entertaining himself while doing as little work as he can get away with. Mm-hmm. They also meet Frau Blucher. Steady! Who is the housekeeper at uh, Castle Frankenstein, played by Cloris Leachman. And she is the, a very iconic, creepy, scary, somebody who knows more secrets than she's revealing kind of character in this gothic horror story. She also feels like the, the especially because they give her the entire like intro to the castle sequence, she feels like the f- most fun episode of House Hunters ever with this, like, <laughs> careful of the stairs, they're treacherous. Like, these little moments where it's just like, you're just telling us to be careful, <laughs> but you're doing so in the way designed to make this the most terrifying it can. And the, the his first entry into the castle, that strikes me as as much a reference to the 1931 Dracula as to yes. any Frankenstein movie. It gives me the same vibe as those opening scenes in Dracula where the lawyer has made his way to Dracula's castle and is seeing this enormous place that is both impressive and squalid and in disrepair. And and they've got Frederick being a little perplexed and a little confused, but also kind of getting the vibe faster it's not a fish out of water. It's a fish finally finding their water story. <laughs> yes, yes. Because he is so much in his element, he becomes more and more what he always was. And he realizes that, like, okay, I don't, like, he's swearing left, right, and center, you know. I don't want to, you know, continue the family experiments, and I don't want to do those those things. Those were awful or horrible. They ruined our reputation. But I do want to find his library because he must have known something. And that drive turns into, well, here's a book on how to. OK. Because they, they hunt through the place and they find secret passages and follow violin music. And they find the secret library with with all the uh, the notes that his grandfather left about his ex- uh, experiments, including a big volume labeled How I Did It. Yeah, by Victor Frank, by, by Henry Frank- Frankenstein. Yeah, it's like, it's like this is just a giant novel on how, on, like, <laughs> I, how I did it. It's not like he has to piece together a whole lot. No, and he proclaims himself through all of this to re- realize that this can be done, and this is what I am for, and I am a Frankenstein. Yeah, he no longer tries to distance himself from from being a Frankenstein. So it's the combination of the place the sense of identity and this information that makes him realize I can actually achieve something by carrying forward my grandfather's work. There's something about the way they portray him just kind of falling into this with such delight that weirdly enough reminds me of my theory about uh, murder. She wrote where it's like Jessica Fletcher projects an aura and if you have someone who is considering committing murder, they will do so when she's in the area. It's like he is always considering mad scientist at science and something about the castle in this environment will cause it to occur. <laughs> There's like a chemical reaction going on here in that same weird it's, way. It's like he's taken that um, that that uh, career guidance test. Exactly. You know, I don't know. The scores say you should be a mad scientist. No, I'm going to be a medical teacher. But really, you really you would be a great mad scientist. Exactly. And you put him in the right environment, and boom, what do you know? Look at him. Really good mad scientist. So he proceeds to to try to recreate his great grandfather's work. And here is where they they go into more detail 
than the 31 version. They do. In that they're referencing back to the the original Mary Shelley book in more ways, in, yeah. in talking about why is he so big? Well, it's easier to work on a larger scale than a tiny scale with the equipment we have. And the funny thing is that they're doing that simultaneously in a way that fixes, like, not plot holes, but it elaborates on something they skipped in the original movie. And they're doing that to make an inappropriate joke. Oh, yeah. Because they're <laughs> doing both. And that's where you can really see that when they were sitting down and writing this, it wasn't just they were writing things with the entirety of Frankenstein as a cultural and a series of works as their reference points. They're not purely going off of one thing. They're intersecting. They're stitching together pieces to build this in that <laughs> yes. way, which is a fun metaphor here. But when they need something from one of them, they will pull it and use it, but they're never doing so haphazardly. There's always a joke. There's always a callback. There's always, I don't think there's a wasted scene in this movie is what I'm saying. No, every scene either drives the plot or does something interesting with the characters or just gives you funny, often slapstick jokes. And that's what the movie is for. So you're right. There's there's no filler in that sense. Yeah. There's nothing that was put in just because it was supposed to be. I get the impression that that Brooks and Wilder were happy with everything they put in this. And the, the two of them wrote this together. Yeah. And they had worked together before. And there are different stories about how the movie came to be. One that I've heard is that Gene Wilder, working on a previous movie, came to Brooks and said, you know what we should do next? We should make a Frankenstein movie. And Brooks was against it. You know, they've made so many Frankenstein movies, you know, the bride, the son, the sister-in-law, you know, we don't need more Frankenstein movies. And Wilder kept pitching this and suggesting ways it could be done. And yet, it became so very much a Mel Brooks movie, at least as much a Mel Brooks movie as anything else. Oh, yeah. And they take they take set pieces from the original, like the graveyard scene that is at the very beginning of the 31 movie. This is one of those areas where it's like shot for shot almost and line for line absolutely capturing that scene between Gene Wilder and Marty Feldman. But but the same, get down. Yes, down, it's, you fool. Down, you fool. Done in the dramatic style for the original movie has this, this weight and this tension. But you get the two of them peeking up over a railing and then down, you fool. Boom. <laughs> it's like suddenly that becomes a, a silly call out because it's like you're being really obvious. And yet at the same time, Frederick Frankenstein is deadly serious about all of this. Yes. Frederick Frankenstein doesn't really crack any jokes. He'll sometimes use humor to try to get around something or, or lighten a situation, but he's a serious person. And the fact that Gene Wilder is delivering these lines so seriously is part of what makes it work, part of what makes it funny, part of what holds it together and it keeps it from just going off the rails into absurdism. Yeah, he's... The fact that he takes everything deadly serious means that even if you're laughing, the train isn't stopping. And that's the point. That's kind of important to the way this is going. Once this character chose to do this, it's happening. Igor can make all the jokes around it, but he will still orbit uh, Frederick because of the project. Everyone else will still be pulled along by what's happening here. And they can all make the jokes, and he, and even if Frederick becomes a joke at times, there's no moment where he pauses to make a joke. Right. That's right. That's that's kind of that, like that, what you're saying. Like he's never making the joke, and that means he never loses the momentum. And yet we see things like immediately after the the grave robbing scene, they're getting the body home. There's a little bit of humor in recognizing this is not necessarily an easy task, getting a body across town and to the castle late at night and they they drop the coffin it breaks so that one of the corpse's arms dangles out of the side and just at that point uh, the local constable comes by and starts chatting and asking what's up so they do kind of that classic improv bit where 
Dr. Frankenstein is hiding his arm and the dead guy's arm is sticking out from his coat. And Igor is behind the scenes moving around the dead guy's arm to make it look natural so that the police officer does not expect anything. It's a bizarre, funny scene. And yet it all has narrative reasons for being there. They really do want to get away from this constable without him uh, suspecting anything. Oh, yeah. It's every single person in the moment is either, you know, try to act natural or do your job. But the fact that those two things are colliding in this specific way means that we as the audience get to have the amusement. So eventually they see us, gets the pieces back to his lab and assembles them. And, uh, well, he needs a brain just like his great grandfather did. <sighs> and there's a, a very, very similar scene where we've got Igor going to steal a brain from the local uh, morgue. <laughs> the... <laughs> Which actually is telling it from the, the brain depository. Yes. With instructions on the door of what to do if you're trying to make a deposit after hours. Exactly. And this is one of those things I'm going to note. And this is a little meta discussion. I discussed in our last episode about how I've had trouble with that subject. It's been something that has been innately scary to me and innately disquieting. And I found it very interesting watching these back to back. The extremely seriously, the, the self-serious uh, movie Frankenstein had a scene very much like this, which bothered me and was disquieting, but the Mel Brooks comedy version was more disquieting. There's something about the fact that they did a wonderful job not taking themselves seriously in that sense of making that comedic that made the the disconnect more disturbing for me. I found this more disquieting and uncomfortable than the same scene in the original horror film. I can understand that, because at least in the original, it was a serious scene. It was shot seriously, it was blocked seriously, the whole movie was serious. And with that serious tone comes a certain reverence, a certain recognition, wow, this is powerful and important. Whereas making jokes around it, or at least shooting it, having just having Marty Feldman in the scene, <laughs> changes that tone and that lack of seriousness. I could see where that would make it more disturbing. And I can very much appreciate the comedy that goes into him legitimately thinking it's, you know, someone named Abby, you know, Abby Normal. Like, that's, that's brilliant. That's clever. It's fascinating as a chance to be able to review pieces of movies that don't always click or have a negative reaction to people that a comedy moment can be worse than the drama moment but i can still appreciate that it was good comedy even though i can't sit through it and it's worth noting that the the brain that igor is originally sent for is that of hans delbruck who frankenstein describes as a scientist and saint could you imagine this brilliant mind in, in the creature that I created. Hans Delbruck, I presume they're talking about the same Hans Delbruck, uh, a 19th century German military historian and oh. university professor. Huh. Not exactly scientist and saint, but I don't know if, if there was a particular reason why Brooks or, or, um, or Wilder referenced Hans Delbruck. Maybe it's just a very German-sounding name, even though that's set in Transylvania. Maybe it's just a very German-sounding name, and, and yeah, he was a respected university professor. Uh, I, I kind of wonder about that, but hey, a little trivia. There really was a Hans Delbruck, and uh, they didn't get to use him uh, in, the, uh, in Frederick Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, there's just a lot of odd, like, <laughs> the, guys, the guys listed on the Wikipedia page for this movie now. <laughs> the reference to Delbruck? Yeah. <laughs> It's like the, he 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 has an in fiction section now, in part thanks to this. Fifty <laughs> percent of it. It's like what in the world? Okay. Well, eventually, all the pieces are in place: the body, the the, the brain from somebody named Abby, and it's time to bring the monster to life. And this is where the homage to the original is so incredibly evident. The, the laboratory of Dr. Frankenstein that 
of his great grandfather that uh, Frederick has moved into and, and used. Because it's the same piece, isn't it? It's a very similar set, and they got a lot of the very same equipment. Knew it. There is a a thanks in the opening credits to Kenneth Strickfadden, who is the guy who originally built the laboratory equipment and effects for the 1931 Frankenstein. He was an engineer of electronics or electrical equipment and, and did a lot of movie props and things, a lot of 20s and 30s science fiction type things. And... So much of what they use in Young Frankenstein is the same stuff that they used in the 30s. And the same things that made it look like grand modern technology in this classical old setting in the original movie are played in color here with such a different... Oh, they they make that scene black and white? This movie, the whole movie is in black oh, yeah, and it white. it is. It is. It's it's easy to forget that because it is so richly oh shot. Oh my goodness, this is in black and white. Such great sh- uh, lighting, such great texture, so darn much better than the transfer of the 31 movie yeah, that we watched a few weeks ago. I forgot the- that. I forgot this is in black and white. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yep, but- it's all in black and white. But you're right that the effects, the visuals of these effects, they would pl- they they were impressive effects for any movie in 1974. But I feel like they played them differently here. Instead of being made and instead of being shot with this like low angle, like towering greatness of new technology kind of thing, they're shot with a bunch of deep close ups to these big mechanical pieces in ways that I maybe I'm just reading this differently. There was something about this that made this feel grand because it requires such scale. There was still reverence for the machinery, but the machinery is shown to be this this sparking, sputtering behemoth. There's something a little bit more monstrous and and over dramatic in the way the machinery is depicted. And it's not shown as this harsh contrast to the setting. It's shown as like it's part of aesthetically in the amount of time since the first movie depicted this contrast young frankenstein depicts these as a cohesive behemoth that can do these terrifying grand things in the same sense that frederick frankenstein is finally where he belongs which is in this lab doing this work all of this equipment is where it belongs because it is all together and there is a sense that in addition to attempting to resurrect life, to create life, he has also taken on the the daunting and impressive task of resurrecting this laboratory and resurrecting this old equipment to do what it was designed to do all those decades ago. Mm-hmm. Instead of dramatic angles trying to show like the machinery through the beams of the castle, there's a lot more stepping back with a camera and showing that this is twice the height of either of our scientists here doing this this thing that requires like a stepladder to reach the levers and the stepladder is funny but it's also making this big heavy thing this this mountain moving machine that brings life yeah there were more high angle shots more distant shots that kind of show individual people and things being dwarfed in this space some of that was possible just because of the improvements in film technology, mm-hmm. but you're right. It, it gives you a different sense of scale and how these things fit together. And it, it presents the same, the, the same technology is being shown a different kind of reverence in this irreverent movie. <laughs> but they still have the, the, the slab with the table uh, hoisted to the roof during a thunderstorm from, with mighty chains and dramatic speeches by Dr. Frankenstein. And at first, it doesn't seem like it worked. It doesn't. So we get, some, we get to have some jokes about Frederick Frankenstein being a terrible loser, uh, be, being terrible about d- handling uh, a lack of immediate success. But then it turns out 
no, actually, the monster is alive. It just took a little while for it to kick in. They do a lot of fun with that, with the like, with the 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 moaning of of woe is me being also the moaning of the monster in the background. It's worth mentioning that as straight as Gene Wilder plays it as Frederick Frankenstein, for the most part, there are occasional breaks of the fourth wall. The only ones I could remember were by Igor and later on by The Monster. Just with occasional looks in the camera or comments addressed to the camera by by either of those, there's at least those characters kind of, they know they're in a horror movie. Exactly. Peter Boyle plays this character who is expressive and responsive, even when he's just going, Ugh. Yes, Peter Boyle as the monster, he finds the right tone to play a... A, a menacing, giant, horrible monster in the context of this comedy. There's something about the way they show it, because there's another character who never quite breaks the fourth wall, but is a little bit more aware of the the ridiculous grandeur, and that's Frau Blucher. Oh, she has some points later when we learn more about her. It's almost like anyone who is forced out, who is kept separate from the village and the society and the little structure of who is put where. Anyone who doesn't have a a place to fit in, even if your place to fit in is the mad scientist in his castle. If you're out of the if you're out of that little continuity, you're given the leeway to step back and say, isn't this ridiculous? Like the audience gets to. You're given that little bit of a, a a fourth wall power by being made an other yeah, in this story that, and the way they present this world. That's an interesting point. We are outsiders in the same way that Frederick Frankenstein tried to be, but decided not to be. The same way that the monster is, whether he wants to or not. Same way that Igor is. And just, he's happy to be. And he, he, he's, he, he loves being out here. It's fun out here. And, and Frau Blucher kind of, kind of winds up like, reveling in the grand picture of it all because she's this character who doesn't quite fit the way the narrative wanted her to. Rob Blucher, it always seems to me that she is, she is part of the castle. Yes. She has like, she was there when they arrived. She was there when Frederick's grandfather was there. She, she is part of the castle but the castle is a very different place for her than it is for anyone else. It is not gloomy. It is not menacing. It is grand. The grandfather Frankenstein's work was not scary and presumptuous and dangerous. It was impressive and noble and ambitious. And she had this great attachment to it because, as we learn, he was her boyfriend. Exactly. And there's this big dramatic reveal and this little bit of a. I don't know what to do with that info <laughs> yes. from everyone else because she hasn't, if she yelled any character archetype, any trope, any, any role in the playbill of the original story, it's like everyone would have just been, oh, okay, and it would click. <laughs> she said a character that doesn't fit with anything's assum- anyone's assumption, and she's kind of put in this... Well, what do we do then? Category. <laughs> and that's where she gets to be this overdramatic, selling it to the rooftops character who's a little bit outside along with the other ones. And what we end up with, once we have Peter Boyle as the monster, is for the most part, we have a long series of set pieces that are parodies of set pieces from original Frankenstein movies, either the the original 31 movie or Bride of Frankenstein, or I think some of the other sequels. And those are done, again, in this kind of loving parody sort of way. We have the encounter between the monster and the little girl, and they're throwing flowers in the water, and she's asking, oh no, the flowers are all gone. What are we going to throw in next? And he just gets this deadpan look at the camera. He just barrels the camera with a, wow, well, what do you think? <laughs> but the fun thing is, this movie also doesn't kill off the little girl. They 
he catapults her into her house and she lands in her bed, knocked unconscious. <laughs> but she just winds up being put back at home. Yeah. She's Theor- theoretically needing a maybe not maybe not free of scrapes and bruises and a bump on the head, but implied to be okay. Yeah, instead of a parent carrying the lifeless body of his child through a wedding celebration like we get in the 31 movie, we get that those moments of the parents of this little girl being frantic because they can't find her. And then they realize they 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 didn't check her room upstairs. And of course, that's at the moment where he get uh, the monster gets on the, the seesaw and she's catapulted through the window into bed. So instead, we get that relief from the parents. Oh, she's here. She's safe and sound. Everything's okay. And the monster was part of that. In some ways, that's the that moment is also where the movie reassures you that this might be a a joke on a horror film, but they're not going to be gruesome about it in that same way. I feel like that's a a a don't worry moment. And unless I'm mistaken, the 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 monster of Peter Boyle's version of the monster can be he's big, he's menacing, he can be violent. He reacts similarly to he likes beautiful things and music. He hates fire. I don't think he harms anyone who, in cinematic terms, doesn't deserve it. In every comedy scene he's given, he's the straight man, which is amazing. The little girl is is annoyingly insistent about playing games and about how to play them and what to do. Which means that when she gets the comeuppance of being catapulted because she's demanding he play on the seesaw with her, he is merely a consequence of her demand. When he mimics a scene from later movies and meets the blind man. Yes, the blind violin playing hermit in his hut. All of the things he's trying to do are just kind of being an awkward house guest who keeps being hurt and poked and lit on fire by the blind man who just is chill about yes, it's, this entire honestly awful time he's showing his guest. So Gene Hackman as the, the as the blind man is like missing the bowl and dumping hot soup in the monster's lap or lighting the monster's thumb instead of a cigar. And it's he's innocent because he's he's blind. Apparently he's just clumsy and distracted by having a guest for the first time in forever. And the monster, Peter Boyle, is trying not to be a bad guest and can't really speak words anyway. So we just got lots of emoting from him reacting to all this. It's, he, he it's finally slapstick going, comedy, but it's, it's... He's finally going to get a drink and then the toast shatters his glass and he's just... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he is he is not the most dangerous thing in any environment he's put in. There are other scenes where he's captured by the the local police and he's put in chains and he's taunted by by a captain of the guard who I think suffers a bad fate when the monster breaks free. But again, they set those up so that we're still on the monster's side yeah. throughout these scenes. And and the town folk therefore become this all of them are these weird stereotypical characters. The the town is a little more eager and a little more prepped to turn into an angry mob at the first at the first sound of monster. And yet the town guard with his extremely thick accent and wooden arm is like trying to keep the peace, but also being as he is. He is acting as stiff as his arm is portrayed (laughs) to be made yeah, it's Kenneth Morris as Inspector Kemp, who is is his accent is so thick a lot of his own uh fellow villagers do not understand it. And he's constantly like switching out hands on his Yeah, his... <laughs> and manually changing his where his arm is to uh to gesture. And he eventually goes from trying to keep people calm, trying to explain to Frankenstein why people might be a little concerned, to eventually at the end saying, you know, a riot is a terrible, ugly thing, and I think it's high time we had one. Exactly. And and meanwhile, like, as they're going through this, the attempts at, like, 
depicting the monster. And eventually when the monster is recaptured and brought back to Frankenstein, there's a whole like by the mob, I believe. Right. Does the mob catch him then or later? Because I know that there's this entire bit where they're trying to show the monsters okay. Frankenstein eventually manages to teach the monster and get through to the monster enough. And we get a scene that maybe there are things like this in other movies as well, but it reminds me of a different category of monster movies, King Kong. Yes. Where King Kong is brought to the city to be this tremendous stage roadshow. And of course, he then, once you've got him in the middle of the city, he breaks out and terrorizes the city and climbs up buildings. Here, we have something similar in that it's kind of a, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century thing to present scientific curiosities and information to people on the lecture circuit. But we have Frankenstein presenting the monster and having him demonstrate some basic motor skills and, and, and the like. And eventually doing a song and dance routine. <laughs> yes. And, and, and there's, and there, there's this entire discussion and this entire like guidance through, which is very like father son between the two of them. <laughs> there's something very much like you can kind of feel this Gene Wilder making comments on, uh, like performance families where it's like, Oh, the family business is being a performer. It's like, no, g come join me. We're going to do a bit together. Like, and, and there's this things... reluctance, but also awareness from the monster of doing this and trying, but. And when things start to go wrong, Frankenstein is acting less like a scientist. And like you say, more like a stage parent. Yeah. Don't embarrass me. You've got to finish this number. Exactly. That's where <laughs> I'm like, I get the feeling he was letting out stuff about the industry during those <laughs> moments at Maybe. times. And that leads to, again, the, the monster running amok and getting captured and then escaping. And meanwhile, Elizabeth, Frankenstein's fiance, has come to visit in Transylvania. Yes. And she is kidnapped by the monster. And she's already, all, she's being very fussy and her normal problematic self. She's also very unhappy that he is doing anything and being here and doing things yeah and suspicious of this blonde uh lab assistant he's got right so yeah the monster kidnaps elizabeth there are scenes which uh, that which present sexual assault as humor i don't think they would fly now i don't think they were a great idea then yeah but they were part of this uh plot yeah they that that was uncomfortable and unpleasant to watch that's not funny but eventually, Frankenstein realizes that the way to help the monster is with some kind of mind transference, to give the monster some of Frankenstein's knowledge and intelligence, make him more of a complete human being. He's got this entire, like, setup and plan. Like, put machines on both of them, his mind to the monster's mind. His thoughts to the monster's thoughts. There's this whole thing going on here where he's like connecting their minds. Yeah, it's a very 60s and 70s science yeah, fiction kind it, of a trope. It, I, exactly. And it seems to work even though the villagers interrupt the process before it's, it's finished. But they, they're storming the castle to finally do away with the monster once and for all. But by the time they get there, even though the process wasn't able to complete fully, the monster is able to stand up and talk to them and express himself. And they say, well, this is completely different, of course. We'll, we'll just see ourselves out. Uh, oh, sorry to interrupt. And in the end, Frankenstein, Frederick Frankenstein, winds up getting married to Inga. And Elizabeth winds up getting married to the monster. And they're played off as, the monster and Elizabeth are played off as this, like, stereotypical movie or sitcom couple in some ways at the end there. He's just reading the paper and fed up with her shenanigans. Yes, but she fell in love with him because of all the monstrous things about him. Yes. But now after the transference, he's sitting in his pajamas with his reading glasses, reading the Wall Street Journal. Exactly. And meanwhile, Frankenstein and Inga seem to be a lot happier. Exactly. There, there's some fun 
a fun joke at the end there. It sets up off of some of the... They're, they've, they, they've been running a through line through the entire movie that they're able to pay off at the end there. Yes. So it it is this very well-structured, coherent story, longer than it has to be just to tell that story, because they did expand it to make room for more jokes, but the jokes all occur in scenes that have other reasons to exist. It's a long movie, but it's a movie with no dead ends. Yeah. So, as with Mel Brooks's best stuff— it shows a, an ability to make movies, a knowledge of storytelling and a knowledge of movie making that allows you to have the freedom, knowing what the rules are, knowing how to use them, gives you the freedom to make something this weird and funny. Yeah, this is a this is a skillful hand making this commentary. Oh, and speaking of Elizabeth, who gets married to the monster, she gets more and more like the Bride of Frankenstein, the classic image of that character as played by Elsa Lanchester. Yes. With the hair and everything. <laughs> yes. So they don't go in, they, they don't talk about that, but it's, it's a great set of visual jokes turning her into that character. Just incrementally and sometimes suddenly for the reveal. So it's funny. We had a lot more to say about this movie than we did about the 1931 Frankenstein, but there's more to this movie. There is more to this movie. In some ways, the fact that this is a movie that's pulling from all of the things. It's pulling from the book. It's pulling from the original movie. It's pulling from all its sequels. This is this is a, a larger cross-section of Frankenstein as a media entity, which means that there was a lot to dig into. But it's also something interesting to note that this is still just as this is still a faithful dis interpretation of the story in that sense. Oh yeah, this is still a, a, a scientist builds a monster and reaps the consequences of his creation. <laughs> it's just a very different way to play each of those scenes in that same structure and and consequence chain does happen <laughs> throughout this movie, just in funny results. So, I guess final question time. It is a movie. Screen or no screen? I'm going to say screen. I like it. There's a lot of fun bits. There's bits that are hard to watch for me. There's bits that are that don't hit as well possibly because they're references to pop culture at the time or that just don't hold up the same. But even those dulled jokes are are fun to see done well. And I think it's a worthwhile movie overall. Yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah, I, I agree. Screen, unless you know that you just don't like Mel Brooks movies or you just have no knowledge of any of the classic monster movies, this is, is well, first watch those and then consider watching this. Uh, I would say screen this. It's, it's well made. It's well worth watching. And it's just fun. Hmm. So um, this is a... a this is an even weirder question to ask about this than it was about the 1931 We've made it harder. Yeah. This is challenge mode. Uh, revive, reboot, or rest in peace? Well, what even is revive? Revive would be continuing on, which, I mean, you set up some interesting pairs at the end. I guess you could... There's something you could do with revive, but we'll have to check that in at the end. Uh, reboot is just doing another, is actually kind of just doing another comedy parody about Frankenstein, the monster franchise in that sense. And it wouldn't be this anymore. It would be going back to the well this plumbed. And I don't know what you'd do to make that work better than this did. You could do something different, but then you're not even doing this again. So it kind of self cancels itself there. And, and there have been other Frankenstein themed comedies, none of them executed as well as this one. So yeah, I I don't need a, a reboot of young Frankenstein in 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 our terms. I don't need someone to try to retell this story because this story is so tied to the style in which it was told, the people who told it, you're much better off doing your own thing. Revival I, I'm not sure I would trust anyone other than the people like Mel Brooks and Gene Wilder to, which, you know, they're not going to make a revival of this movie. 
and I don't know that I want to see someone else do so. I could imagine some stories, though. You could. There's something to be said for the fact that you've got the pairing of this intelligent uh, version of the monster and his wife just kind of being a sitcom couple. I'm not big on that, but I mean, we've got the Adams family. You could do something with this. You could go do that continuation. Well, if we want to do something else that's like generations later, the way this was generations after the original, we end this movie with two married couples. Yeah. Do they have kids? Do their kids meet? Do they do their kids have to team up to do something in the future? I made a point of talking about the the original that there's a lot of modern movies that are doing the same Prometheus story with modern tech because that's the technology we're making our things of in that sense the same way the the electricity and iron were the technology of the time bringing the monster to life I referenced Ex Machina as a counterpart doing a doing a revival where Frankenstein Incorporated is this tech genius tech, <laughs> tech empire making VR and cybernetic stuff even if it's not selling well and kind of getting to do another we're falling down the same pitfall story with the new tech in a parody and a reference to these other things taking their reference from it could be fun and it's and and if if you want to make it a revival of this it's maybe its founders are the child or grandchild of Frederick Frankenstein and Inga and the child or grandchild of the creature and Elizabeth. I'm sorry. I'm also just realizing you got the fun of having an assistant AI to our main character programmed off after an old assistant who worked with the family. And of course, Igor is assisting everyone. <laughs> That's lowercase I capital G. Exactly. <laughs> You'd have a lot of fun with that. Yes. See, the, so, you could actually get a, you could actually do that. It's a different kind of, yeah, but. Yeah, it's one of those, I want to think about revivals, but I don't actually want someone to go out and make one. Exactly. So all of that notwithstanding, I'm going to say rest in peace. Same. This is a rest in peace, but a loving one. Well, that was fun. That was fun. Yeah, I figured it was, it was a good way to continue our, our Frankenstein themed Halloween season for 2022. I have no clue what we're doing next, though, because <laughs> we've got three this month. That's right. We've got, it's a three-episode month this October, so I've got something else in store. We're not doing the Abbott and Costello yet, are we? No, no. That'll be sometime in the future okay. we'll actually turn our attention to Abbott and Costello movies. Hmm. But we will be back with another Halloween episode. Okay. More spooky coming. In the meantime, Dad, where can they find you online? Uh, you can find me most places as by Matthew Porter. So Twitter uh, at by Matthew Porter. You can go to by com, and that's where you'll find links to anything else I'm doing to uh, you know, YouTube, anything else where I might be found. And Ian, where can people find you? I can be found as item crafting on Twitter, as item crafting live on Twitch and at itemcrafting.com. And you can find the podcast on Twitter as IMMPCast and online as IMMProject.com. And that's where you will find all of our back episodes, plus links to our Patreon. Thanks very much to anybody who's supporting us there. And uh, you'll find links to our YouTube channel. And by the way, there's more and more up there on YouTube because we're putting up clips as well as full episodes of the podcast. And in the future, we'll have some more uh, live streams and other bonuses there on YouTube. Exactly. And you'll also find a link on immproject.com to our shop if you like uh, T-shirts and, uh, and coffee mugs and other fun things. And, uh, oh, and one other thing you'll find there is a contact page where you can contact us and you'll also see our P.O. box there at immproject.com. And... To continue celebrating our 100th episode from now until the end of the year, if you send us a self-addressed stamped envelope at that P.O. box, we will send you back a sticker. Exactly. You can you can get some free IMMP merch. But mostly, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much for downloading. Thank you very much for telling your friends about the podcast. And we really look forward to being back with you in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, go find something new to watch. I was...
going to make espresso.